Cullo and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. It is my pleasure today to interview Dr. Peter McGahey, who is a coach developer, so someone that's also passionate about developing coaches and a teaching assistant professor at West Virginia University. Uh, he's coached NCAA Division One, Division Two men's and women's soccer for over 20 years. He's got all sorts of degrees and he's uh, definitely a a licensed soccer coach. So listen, uh, without further ado, Peter, welcome to the show. And do you prefer more sunrise or sunset? Emma, I appreciate that. Sunrise, because it speaks to the potential of the day. Oh, look at that. We've already got a gold dust moment from Peter on the show. Um, Peter, let's start with why do you coach? The reason I coach is one, I'll give you two. One is I could never have seen myself sitting behind a desk all day and doing doing just a job. I wanted to be out amongst the players outside again in, in my sport on the grass in the park in the sun etc and i really love to help people become the best versions of themselves mm. and can you take us back to that moment you know when five-year-old peter who did he want to be and when did you discover coaching this is it for me so i would say i grew up i grew up in denver and I played for my dad. So I had this like tr what I would call this traditional American sports background. I played at the park. I walked to the park. And we had this English gentleman who came over every summer. His name was John Drabwell. And he came over and he was a soccer coach. And I thought that was like the coolest thing ever that somebody could actually be a soccer coach. And you know, you're you. It's not necessarily in soccer. It wasn't something that as an a, as a young American player that you were ever sort of aspiring to be. But that that seed was planted, and then fast forward into where I played in college, and then I was getting ready to graduate with college, and I had the traditional uh, communications degree with a minor in business, which means I didn't really know what I was going to be doing with my life. So I then I was like, I had an I had an internship my senior year. And I was in a desk job and I was like, this is, I cannot do this. I can't do this. So I said, okay, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get a physical education teaching certificate and I will teach and coach. And that decision to go back to get a teaching certificate led me to now begin my coaching career with uh, youth clubs in Denver, getting into the college game, getting into co the coach development work. But it was really that internship and just saying, no, I, I don't want to be stuck in a desk. And yes, I want to be out on the grass with people helping them grow, helping them experience the beautiful game of soccer. That really led me on the path that I'm on now. Mm. One thing I want to pick up on straight away is that there was someone out there who believed in you. Someone who, you know, this the coach that actually says, hey, you know what? I see something in you. And I think we all have that person. Like even now I ask our audience just to reflect on like who was that early person that believed in you and said, hey, you can do this. Do you want to elaborate on what I just said there? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's a place. It's an amazing part when I start to think about your question. I start to think about it, the varying chapters that I've had in my life and in my career as like that there's been mentors and people of influence at almost every step of the way who sort of continue to pull you a little bit further, stretch you a little bit farther. But as you mentioned, it really comes back to belief. I remember, again, I'll, I'll give you just a couple that I've been very fortunate to have. When I was a player and I was about 17, I had a coach, Steve Betcher, who is the first coach that I never had other than my dad. And it was amazing that he believed in me just to put me on a team, to put me in, in to play, to demand more of me, to have expectations. But it was somebody outside of my sort of immediate family who didn't have to, but chose to. And then as a young coach, I was very fortunate to have a, a mentor. His name is Paul Dreesen. And Paul was incredibly shaping for me because he saw he he clearly saw something in me that 
um, I had not uh, yet grown or not yet cultivated, but he was really instrumental early in my career in terms of uh, helping me learn my own coaching pedagogy, learning how to coach, learning what I believed, how I could teach the game, learning how I wanted to connect with players and people. He also was the first person to ever expose me to coach developer. Because again, I think sometimes in soccer, it's a place of where if you're enthusiastic and energizing and you work in a youth environment, that all of a sudden you're teaching coaches well beyond and far earlier than you ever ever really sort of needed to. So you're really stretched in that capacity. And Paul's belief in me was really instrumental in, in terms of my career to venturing out and those things. And we've been able to reconnect throughout my career and always sort of grounded in our in our early relationship. And then as I've gotten moved on in my career path, I connected with a, a gentleman. His name is Dr. Peter Piero. So it's Dr. Peter and Dr. Peter, which is sort of like this weird, weird thing. But he's helped me continue to explore my curiosity for learning and pedagogy and has really helped me in the role as a coach developer to continue to even challenge myself to become and to continue to grow and to become the best version of myself and to recognize that that is a daily pursuit. But it's fascinating to see how many, many mentors. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say sort of this idea of, I spent a little bit of time in parasport as well, in terms of working with CP soccer. I do a little bit of work with uh, the Down Syndrome uh, Sports of America with their futsal team. And I put together uh, local um, soccer opportunities for uh, the disability and para community in my own communities. And I would say that that person who introduced me to that was my mom, that she, my mom had always wanted to be a special education teacher. It's something that she never was able to do. But I realized that that was a real powerful place for me to give back. So it's a place that I'm always incredibly grateful and appreciative of those people who, and I've clearly undoubtedly left out like more than I could, more than I could count. So if I left you off the story, I'm certainly, I'm certainly sorry. It's not that I didn't mean to, it's just uh, that I, I can't mention everyone at every chapter, but it's just an amazing piece about how much gratitude I have for those people who believed in me and helped shape who I am and where I'm continuing to go. Yeah, absolutely. We have so many influences, role models, um, people that have impacted our, our coaching. So thank you for sharing those people. So I want to go there. I want to want to talk about the, the parent coach. Is it possible for a parent to coach their kid? Yes. Y yes, it is because I think it's a place of where um, I think parent coaches at the times that we, when we, when we think about youth sport, we jump to this idea that parents somehow are the biggest problem. Like there, there's lots of there's lots of challenges with youth sports. So I always just say let's yeah, let's yell a light about making sort of this universal statement that this is the biggest challenge. I think it's the place that can parents coach their own kid. Yes, I think it's a place where um, there are certain challenges, there are certain unique things. It's not an infinite it's not an infinite relationship because eventually kids will outgrow their parents. And I think it's a place where um, you have to humbly do that. I would say that I was good fortune to coach both of my kids for a little while. And I was certainly happy to when I got to step off the sideline and just to be able to step back into that dad role. And I think that was the place that would be the lesson that I would take away from it is, is that when I was coaching them, I was very clearly coaching them. And I was always their dad. And I think it's a place of where um that was always a role that I that I sought to maintain. Like in this role, I was doing this and I was always going to be their dad. And I always try to communicate those expectations with them clearly. And I would share as this, as my kids have gotten older, my son has outgrown, outgrown soccer. He's he he does track and field now. And then my daughter still continues to play. But I would share with you is, is that there's always a time where in our conversations, there's times where I feel like that they're asking and I have to check myself of saying is, do you want the coaching answer now or do you want the dad answer now? And I think it's a place where with the dad answer, it always is the same. I love watching you play. I love watching you throw. I love watching you doing whatever you're doing. And that can be enough. And I would share for large parts of when their their lives that that has been enough. And the few times that they've asked for the coaching part, okay, we can have that conversation. But I've always just been really respectful of those roles. Thank you for sharing that. The two things that really stood out are around knowing when the time is 
ready or when your children are ready to then pass them on to the next coach and having a contextual marker. Hey, I got my dad hat on. I got my coach hat on. I got my friend hat on. You know, what do you need from me in this moment? So thank you for sharing all of those things. I really appreciate it. The other thing that really intrigues me about what we're talking about is the difference between coaching and teaching. You're a teaching assistant. So professor and then you've got your coaching hat on and then you've got potentially even a coaching developer hat on. So could you share your reflections on the similarities or differences, whatever your take is between teaching, coaching and coach developing? I think the common thread for me is, is that you're helping people discover the best versions of themselves. Sort of the con- the contextual similarities between if you're coaching a team, you're coaching a team of athletes and players who are striving to accomplish goals, you're who are striving to discover who they are, where they are, where they can go, where they can take this to become the best versions of themselves. If you're in a classroom, I've always approached the classroom as a very similar in from a very similar vein. There's always sort of some contextual constraints with those things, but again, the reality is is the learners are there to learn to grow, to discover what they don't know, to test themselves, to challenge themselves. So I've always looked at that. And then coach developing for me is very similar. It's But it's now it's in a one, it's typically in a one-on-one environment. It could be in a formal course. It could be in an informal way. But that individual has goals, has expectations, has things that they would like to achieve. And my responsibility in all of those places is to guide, support, encourage help them to learn and grow and understand, fill in gaps when they have gaps. But I I look at the place, Emma, I see more similarities in those capacities than I see differences. And that's probably, it's a place of why I'm able to sort of work in those things in very sort of, in, in very similar ways. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Interestingly, I believe that And the reason I do this podcast, right, Coach for Success in Sport and Business, is exactly what you just said. Some people say, well, a sports coach is very different to a business coach. Well, actually, really, the through line or what's beneath it all is unlocking the learning of the person who's in front of you, whether you're a business coach or whether you're a sports coach. So the modes of how we go about it potentially can be different at times, but I certainly do Coaching is coaching to me. So on that note, in one to a maximum of three words, what do you think makes a great coach? Care, joy, and passion. They have to know that you care about them as a person first. It can't just be about players and performers. It has to be about the human beings in front of you. There has to be real joy when you teach, that it has to bring a real um feeling of fulfillment and contentment both for you as the coach or coach developer and you want to create joy in the sports experience for your athletes and then i think you have to have passion for passion for your what passion for your sport passion for people passion for people reaching their potential that's why i think it's a place where the three words are care joy and passion And do you think that that applies to a business coach as well as a sports coach? I think it's a place where if I was working with somebody in a business setting, I would hope that the person would want me to care about them as a human being, that they would want me to find joy in the experience that we were having together to help them reach their potential, and they would find joy in that relationship. And then that they would recognize that I could be passionate about them I not, might not necessarily have to be passionate about building factories or producing a product or doing those things, but I could bring real passion and enthusiasm for them or for people, for human relations, and that they would find a common a common ground in that. So I think that there's more similarities than differences for sure. And can you think of a, a story, a coaching story, where either one of these things happened or one of these things was missing And what was the result? Yeah, I I think it's a place where, so I was, I was good fortunate to to allow me to coach um, at Minnesota State Mankato in what now is more than almost 11 years ago, which I can't believe that that this happened that fast. 
But I would describe that team as one of the places where all three of those things were clearly evident, meaning that the team cared about each other. They cared. They had a legitimate care and connection for each other. They cared about us as a coaching staff. We had been together for a while. There was real expectation. But I think it's a place where then the joy of playing, the joy of the pursuit of playing the game, of playing together and creating expectations to achieve something that had never been done before was clearly evident. But it was just the joy and the thrill of being together and pursuing that that still stands out to me today. Not everybody had the experience that they wanted. Not everybody got to play the role that they wanted, but everybody got to play a really worthwhile role and found real joy in that. And then the passion for accomplishing something that had never been done, accomplishing something with your peers and friends and colleagues was so incredibly valuable that it became – the passion became – the passion and the joy became the work, that it became the part of what we were doing on a regular basis is trying to find that joy, trying to, fu to, to drive towards that passion because we all want it to be a little bit better every day and, and to be able to reach – um, to reach further than we ever had to. I wish that that story had ended with like sort of this glamorous confetti falling from the season, ceiling, but uh, unfortunately, no. Um, it ends like much like m some coaches, c coaching stories do, which is one kick short and one penalty kick uh, too few. But it's a place of where that that really stands out. That all three of those pieces are really evident, and I think that 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 that's really the case from a coaching standpoint. I think as a coach developer, I'm really fortunate now to work with some. Um, some really incredible people, but I would share him on something it's you said before is that the idea is that it's about unlocking the learning in the people. And I would share that's probably the place where I've my own vulnerability would tell you that early on in my career, it was a lot about the sport. It was a lot about me. And I think it's a place of where as I've continued on my own journey, it's to recognize that it's unlocking the learning of the person who's in front of us that really that really begins to start to capture that, the essence of what coaching is. And that's where I go back to now is, is that when I'm in a coach developer role and the coach that I'm working with recognizes that they that I care about them, that I want to see them succeed, that it's about their goals, it's about what they're trying to gain from this learning experience and recognize that I'm there to support them and to learn alongside them. That then brings joy in the pursuit. It brings joy in the pursuit for both the learner or the, the, the coach that I'm working with. And it brings joy for me because now I'm feeding my own curiosity that I'm growing, but I'm also helping them along the way towards to their pursuit and to their passion. And I think that's a place then we happen to share the passion of, of of soccer, so I think it's a place where it's as it's as it as I've recognized as it becomes more about the team, more about the individual, more about the coach. The more those three elements of great coaching for me are able are able to come come not even rushing out, but come roaring out. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Let's say you're coach developing a a young coach who who doesn't believe in, in sort of what you just said there in terms of, you know, you, you certainly have a player centered approach to coaching and let's say that they grew up under a direct and tell uh, style of coach and that worked for them. And they've gone on to have a pretty solid uh, playing career in their chosen sport. And you, you're talking about a player centered approach to coaching and they don't agree with it. That's not their goal. That's not what motivates them. What do you do there? Well, I think walk away is just not the right, not the right, not the right answer. But I, I, I think the, the piece. I think it's a place of where you, you, I have. Two, you have two approaches. I think that there's a place where, in that moment, you, you have to recognize that that's individuals' opinions, perspectives, and thoughts are incredibly valid are real and tangible to them and they've seen good success with it. And I think that there's no opportunity for growth if my approach as a coach, as a coach developer, as coach developer, certainly to immediately come in and say, oh, oh, that's wrong. 
That's that's wrong. Let me just tell you. Oh, hey, it's great, great to meet you. Thanks so very much. Let me just tell you 100% that that's wrong. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna meet that person where they are, and you're not really caring about them if you take if you take that approach. So my, my perspective and approach in this has always been to now to listen to learn, to share when I can share. And the reality is, is that that coach's experience, again, the, the reality is, is if a coaching style or a command style coach, right, who's directive, like, again, let, let's just say this, there's coaching behaviors that are clearly wrong, like clearly wrong about bullying, abuse, those things. We just have to say 100% like that's wrong. And if that was a place where that coach was there, I would absolutely say, no. But the reality is, is that there's going to be a, a wide spectrum of potential coaching behaviors that a coach could utilize. So a coach could be a guided coach, a coach that asks, loves to ask lots of questions, or a coach could be really authoritarian, direct, command-oriented, and I would argue still very athlete-centered. It's their preferred coaching style. And I think sometimes getting to know coaches about what's their preferred style, now you're able to now have a different approach to those behaviors. How could you be more effective in this situation or this situation? But most coaches will have a preferred style. It's my responsibility as a coach developer to meet them where they're at, to help them grow if they would like to grow and build their competency, which may or may not mean that they have to change their style. Right answer. Meet them where they're at and what we are talking about is a style. And my biggest aha moment in my coaching came when I realized I had to adapt my style in certain situations to bring out the best in others. But I definitely had that situation as a coach developer. So even though it was a hypothetical question, it was it was a real question for me. And it was a real that. eye-opening experience that I had back in the day when I was a coach developer. That really challenged me and pushed me to become a better coach developer. And yep. you even mentioned it a little bit before around how we have to park our ego. You didn't use the word ego, but you know, so about me, when something's all about me, it's like, hang on a minute. Well, hang on. If I can park that for a minute and truly listen and understand and meet people where they're at, it's really awesome advice. It doesn't matter whether you're developing another coach or you're working with a player or you're in the business world and you're, and you're working with someone else. Okay, so I'd like to now go and ask you uh, one of our questions as part of season six that we are super fascinated with AI and technology and the way that things are moving, and that is in the ever-evolving coaching landscape, what disruptive idea do you have that could impact the way we coach in 2030? Oh. I think it's I think that there's two things. One, I think in 2030 if if you thought back and looked at 7 years ago. Like the reality is 7 years ago we were still having to f have a hard time finding games and activities on the internet that fit our particular sport. The reality is is now is any coach at any level anywhere in the world can have games, drills, ideas at their fingertips. I think the the disruptive idea is going to be that it's going to be we're going to be moving back to the idea about how do we impact and how do we communicate more effectively with people how do we help people and again this idea of meeting them where they're at but recognize that we don't have to be at where they're at anymore so i think the idea is is ai is going to play a role in this as it relates to now creation of activities creation of data use of video and film those pieces of information are going to be at coaches' fingertips more than ever. And what that's going to put a premium on is, is that we're still coaching people, that I'm not coaching robots, that I'm not coaching, that I'm not, um, th that I am not in seven years now, just now move, move, moving, moving, moving pawns on a chessboard. No, it's going to be that we're still coaching people. And where I think that we're going to be able to best help coaches, players, and those things is is the technology to be able to support people where they are in terms of video and those things. I would assume someday you're going to be able to – you would be able to potentially mentor me during a coach developing workshop or a workshop in my regular life remotely 
all the time, be able to be able to be there and see and help me uh, adjust my real life behaviors in real time. That I, I, I that I think that's the place where that that is going to be more prevalent than ever. And I've seen some workshops of where, and again, this is a place where COVID again, looking backwards, which isn't that long ago has impacted the idea of how much, how technology is now part of our everyday. I just think those types of behaviors about where we're going to be able to be in front of coaches, in front of athletes in a variety of ways, in ways that we could have never imagined, that's really going to become what the dis disruptive force and the people who are able to operate in that disruption are going to be the ones who are going to be zooming ahead in, in, in 2030. Yeah. And, uh, and adapting because one thing AI can't teach is curiosity and the impact of the communication or how we go about when we say what I is really something that comes to mind. So thank you for sharing that. It also reminds me of a, an academy back in Melbourne, this is about 10 years ago where they filmed, uh, I did a session with a group of kids that was totally filmed with this really amazing camera, like a 360 <laughs> camera. And I was talking about penalty kicks in soccer and yeah. just I just did a piece around to anchor yourself with your breath and being present before you take the kick. So once you've already decided where you're going to go, just being present and trusting yourself. And then they put it onto this headset. So you then a week later, you put a headset on and there's me going through this process for a penalty kick in soccer. And I was like, whoa, that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy stuff is is coming our way. And I think those that don't embrace it are going to be left behind. That's That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would share with you is, is the irony is, is that, you know, that the statistics in soccer is, is if you actually watch kickers, what you were doing with those athletes years ago is actually now the best practices of behavior. If you count and watch penalty kick takers, if they wait like three or four seconds after the whistle blows, their chance of making the kick goes up like almost it becomes like 95%. But if they rush and go too fast, they're more likely to miss or have it be saved. So it's an amazing of where those kind of things are now absolutely happening. And that's the data. That's the piece. But it still is in that moment, you have to connect with the human that they have to trust you and they have to do those things. I think it's great. And then like the, 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 um, uh, the virtual reality headsets, like I can't, I can't even imagine of how that that's like. I haven't, I haven't gotten to watch any games on that and that and virtual reality yet, but I'm certainly know that that's coming, because again, it's as a coach, we don't really see what the player sees. So I think it's a place where if you start to think about this technology, it actually may be able to be that we're going to be able to view film from the player's perspective, from the perspective of the athlete in a way of like, not like a GoPro strap, strapped to somebody's chest, but to really be curious about, again, what did the athlete see? How can I support them in their learning? Because it's really about their context. And that would be no different for business or those things is what's happening on the floor, what's happening on the field. In the moment. It is in the moment, in the moment, in that real moment, in that moment, that we have to be, I think that's the place of where we're going to really see some incredible breakthroughs because you always see it from your own perspective, but there's a place of where we could certainly meet, meet them on their perspective a little bit more effectively. All right. I'd like to finish with uh, Dr. Peters, plural there, co-authoring together on the book around uh, the grassroots of coaching. So using sports psychology and coaching principles effectively. Could you share perhaps top three tips from the book that tangible things that coaches could take away? Absolutely. So I think it's a really a super cool, it's a super cool book. I appreciate you, you bringing it up. I think partially because Peter is a super cool story. So the reality is we wrote, wrote it over COVID. So uh, the other part is, is that also Peter now is 97 years old. Wow. So you're dealing with a coach who has, is at a much different generation. Peter was actually a soldier in World War II. So they're, they're like this, there's this perspective part about it that is there. I think the really interesting power in the book is, is that you have two coaches spread out, two coaches, coach developers over multiple generations who actually 
have more similarities than difference as it relates to coaching people, leading teams, et cetera. I'll go back to this idea about can coaches coach their own kid because we talk about that a little bit in the book. The idea is as we talk about this concept of selective perception, the reality is is that as a parent, I'm always going to perceive my – they're always going to be my child. So if I'm working with parents in a coaching environment, I have to recognize that they have selective perception. They see it through their lens. They see it through their eyes. And we have to acknowledge that we're actually not looking at the same thing. And when we, when we acknowledge that, that makes the, I would share, the stress of the moment or the perspective, perspective. They can be correct in their perspective and incorrect in the, in the environment. So that, that is one. We also speak to this idea about, uh, we introduce this concept of player readiness. And we hear this concept of player readiness a lot in terms of physiologically, like sports science, some real stuff. I think it's a place where this this concept of readiness, if we take it from a more holistic perspective and look at readiness from a broader lens, both physical, emotional, spiritually, just the whole person, are they ready to participate in the things that we're asking them to do? And if we take a longer term approach with it, we absolutely can hit them because it's a place where if they're ready and we have them do it, great. It's a positive experience. If they're ready and we don't let them do it, then they can become really frustrated. Then it happens is, is if they're not ready and we make them do it, now they have a real negative experience with sports. But I would say that this probably applies to business as well. If somebody's not ready and we make them do it, they have a negative outcome. And then the last one is, is that if they're not ready and we don't have them do it, they're okay and it's okay. And I think the idea about readiness and taking a longer term view of youth sport and what experiences that we're asking people to do really leads to much more positive outcomes. So we speak to that and as we lead the player in those things. And then we speak a little bit in the book, just this idea about closure. So this is the place where now are you teaching in those things? So the idea is, is when you're going through experiences with your team, are you always bringing them to closure so that the players know and are ready to move on to the next one? So this could be a game, a practice, a team meeting, et cetera. Always having something to say is, hey, this experience is done. Now we're ready for the new one the new one to begin. So it's really important that we're just utilizing some of these um, best practices with sports psychology and best practices with coaching to be able to create the best learning environment for our players. Well, I feel like I'm ready with care, joy, and passion. Lots of curiosity thrown in there, Peter. It's been a real eye-opener talking to you. I uh, don't think we've had many coach developers on the show. So I, I appreciate the lens cap through which you see coaching. And I really appreciate uh, with selective perception <laughs> and parents out there to be mindful of that and coaches to be mindful that's where they're coming from so that we can unlock the learning with um, by guiding, supporting, and encouraging each other. So that's a wrap. Peter, thank you so much for being on the Coaching Podcast. Emma, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes, a global coaching, mentoring, and U.S. college sporting scholarship placement service. The service helps athletes navigate the often challenging world of choosing your best college fit while maximizing sports performance. Visit www.transitioncoachforathletes.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating review on your podcast listening device. And don't forget to tell a fellow coach about the show. The ball is in your court to take action and enjoy your coaching. <laughs>